I don't need to tell you, I'm sure that wherever you live in the world, uh, certainly if you're living in Europe or in North America, then in our news stories, uh, the stories about gender identity and about sexuality are never far from the headlines. These are just some pictures from the United Kingdom where I live. I live in Ireland, but in the part of Ireland that is still in the United Kingdom. So these are very real and live issues in our world today. But of course, they're not just issues in the news. They're also issues for people, individual people and for families. So although I am speaking to you as someone who is a doctor and a pastor and a theologian, I'm also speaking to you as a man and as a husband and as a father and particularly as a father, thinking about the world that my children are living in, in social media and in the school. It's very clear that they are exposed to ideas that I was not exposed to when I was their age. So we need to think carefully about these issues. But let's start with this subject, the genesis of gender. And I've chosen that title deliberately because uh, this is a... Uh, the word gender and the word genesis are related in the English language. The word gender and genesis both come from a word that means beginning and birth. So we uh, have something in common. There is a connection. Gender is to do with origins. It's to do with birth. It's to do with uh, where we come from. And I'll come back to the meaning of that word a little bit later on. But if we start in the kindergarten, what will you see if you go to a kindergarten, a, a place where young children are, you will see little girls and little boys. And you might notice that they tend to play with different toys. Uh, the girls will often play with dolls. The boys will play with cars. In fact, my son, I have two children. One is a boy, one is a girl. My daughter's first word was mummy, which is lovely. My son's first word was car. <laughs> So I didn't get a first word as daddy, but uh, he is a very typical boy. He likes cars. He's always been interested in them. My daughter has never been so interested in dolls, but certainly I can see some differences between them. Uh, and even just today, I was speaking to a woman who has worked for many years in kindergartens, and she said she has also observed this, that children uh, will tend to, to play with different toys. She can see the differences between the boys and the girls. Now, of course, someone might say, well, this is just because we give boys cars and we give girls the dolls. But actually, there is good research that shows that these differences tend to be true when we study them across groups. It's very clear that there are gender differences and gender specific effects on children's toy preferences. These are large and reliable. There is good research evidence to say that boys tend to like cars Girls tend to like dolls. That is not to say every girl likes dolls and every boy likes cars, or that if a girl likes cars, she is not really a girl, or if a boy likes dolls, he's not really a boy. But it is to say that there is something that runs true across cultures that is not simply cultural. So it seems that when we look at the kindergarten, there are two identities, boys and girls, but we live in a world with a rainbow of identities. Of course, the rainbow flag uh, was created in 1978 by Gilbert Baker to describe eight values of the gay community. It changed in 1979, simply because there was a shortage of pink fabric at that time. So they took the color pink out to make it easier to create, but still it's very similar. And then it has had different versions over time, but perhaps the most familiar now is the one from 2018, which also has these colors, pink and light blue and brown and black, which are meant to represent people of color and also people who are transgender or identify as transgender and are non-binary, a rainbow of identities. But when we think about these identities, we might make a list like this in English, LGBTQIA+. And we could define what each of these are, women attracted to women, men attracted to men, people attracted to more than one gender, transgender, someone whose identity or sense of identity doesn't conform to their biological sex, queer, questioning or rejecting labels. Intersex is used for people whose bodies don't have all the typical features of one sex. Asexual, someone who doesn't experience sexual attraction. And the plus 
is for every other identity that is not encompassed in the ones above. And this list could become longer and longer and longer. So many different identity. But it's quite important actually to separate these identities out, to realize that we're talking about several different things. These four, L, G, B, and A, are about sexual attraction, sexuality, if you like. T is about a sense of identity, who I am. And the I, well, that is about a physical difference, a difference in the body. And the Q, well, the Q is a radical ideology, which really doesn't say the same things as these other ideologies. This is an alliance of causes which have different values. They have different emphases. In the case of the L, the G, the B, the A, and the T, it's about our thoughts, our feelings, our actions. The I is about the body, and the Q is a, an ideology. In other words, the L, the G, the B, the A, the T, and the I, these are really about individuals in their thinking and feelings, or in the I, in their body, in intersex. But the Q is about the whole of society. Now, I'm saying that because it might seem as if the rainbow flag and all of these identities belong together. But actually, as we'll see, they have some different divergent ideas. How did we get to this position in Europe where we have so many different ideas in, in uh, the Western world today? Well, let's think of a little history of sex and of gender in, in Europe. I've put on this the line Christianized. Of course, Europe was never perfectly Christian. It was never uh, following Christian values perfectly, but there was a time when Christian values were dominant across Europe. So we believe that there are two sexes that are equal in status, in value, but have different roles that are given by God. We believe that homosexual desire was wrong and that homosexual activity was sinful. That was generally believed. People believe that marriage was a covenant between male and female for God's purpose, and that gender was derived from sex, from the biological sex. But of course, before Christianity in Europe, the dominant way of thinking was the Greco-Roman thinking, at least across much of Europe, not in Ireland where I live, but in many parts of Europe. And after Christianity, we could think of the Enlightenment, so-called, in the 18th century. And then we have two new waves of thinking. In the 1950s onwards, we have the sexual revolution. And from the 1990s onwards, we have queer theory. So let me explain what each of those means. When we think of the sexes, in the Roman world, the idea of equality of the sexes was not really there. The idea of equality is a Christian idea, not just between the sexes, but equality of all people. In the Roman world, if you were a slave, you certainly weren't equal to your master. And if you were rich, you were higher than those who were poor. And if you were a man, you were higher than a woman. That's how the Romans thought, and that was seen as acceptable. So there was male superiority and dominance. Christianity said, know that men and women are equal in value and status, but they have differences. With the Enlightenment, the idea was still there that there is equal status, but different roles. But you notice I have changed the bit of why that is. For the Christian view, these differences came from God. In the Enlightenment, people said, well, they come from nature. And maybe God created nature, or maybe we don't need God as a creator. But the basis for this was saying, this is what nature shows us. Then in the 1950s, the idea of differences between the sexes was increasingly challenged. That's part of the sexual revolution and, of course, the rise of feminism. And so we want equality, but we want to eliminate the differences of role. And then in the 1990s, you get this radical ideology, queer theory, which says, actually, the idea of sexes, of biological sex, is a social construct. It is a constructed idea. In other words, what happens? A baby is born and the midwife or the doctor says it's a boy, it's a girl. That is a label that is assigned at birth. 
So you will hear people now talking not about my sex, my biological sex, but the sex assigned at birth. We'll come to why they might say that a little bit later. And then think about homosexuality. Well, in the Roman world, there was an accepted form of homosexuality. But that form would not be accepted today because it was from a man to a boy, from one with power to one who had no power. And it was seen as acceptable for a man to have a homosexual relationship with a boy until he got married. It was Christians who said, no, that is wrong. In the Enlightenment, or after the Enlightenment, well, people still said that homosexuality is wrong, but not because God says it's wrong, but because it's unnatural. It's not the way of nature. And this meant that for a long time, we had Christians or people who held the Christian value. God says it is wrong. And those who didn't hold to a Christian value, but they still said it's unnatural. So we won't have that. But of course, the next step, once you remove God as the authority, is that some people say, but this attraction seems natural for me. For some people, it seems natural to them to have same-sex attraction. And so you have the rise of the LGB uh, rights groups saying we should have rights for same-sex relationships. And we see now that in many parts of certainly Western Europe, uh, we have same-sex marriage that has become law. But queer theory from the 1990s onwards goes further still. It says that some attraction is normal for most people to both sexes. In other words, every person has, or almost everyone has some attraction to both sexes. In other words, the idea that there are categories of heterosexual and homosexual is too narrow. Everyone is on a spectrum. Again, I will come back to that. And what about marriage? Well, in the Roman world, there was marriage between men and women. But notice I've put the words why that is in red. They were for the sake of society and family. The Christian view of marriage is not exactly like that. The Christian view says that marriage is for God. It is a covenant under God. And when the Enlightenment so-called came, then people rejected the idea that marriage comes from God but they said it is a good thing for society and family. That looked like they believed the same thing as Christians. So we were saying the same thing about what we wanted society, but actually the reason was different. But the next step when you have rejected God is to say, well, marriage is really not about the family or society. It's about two people and their love for each other. And it's a contract. And from the mid 20th century onwards, people increasingly said that marriage is about romantic love primarily and divorce should be possible when two people choose not to be married anymore. They should be free to separate. Queer theory goes further. Queer theory says, well, actually, it's too narrow to say that two people should be able to marry if they are a man and a woman. Marriage should be from anyone to anyone for the sake of love. But the reason is still the same for the love between the people, which was the main argument for same-sex marriage when laws were changed. People should be able to have love for whoever they like. And what about gender? Well, here you'll notice that the red text only begins in the 1950s because in the Roman world and in the Christian thinking and in the Enlightenment era, era so-called, the idea was that gender is derived from our biological sex. And if it is derived from our biological sex, well, the Romans believed that, Christians believed that, the Enlightenment said that, it comes from nature. But in the 1950s, with the sexual revolution, now the idea was that gender is not something that comes from our biology. It is something that is created by society, a social construct. That's a very different thing. So this is truly new from the 1950s, not only new um, as a, a way of living, but also new as an idea. And inner identity for queer theory, it says, well, actually, Gender doesn't come from society, it comes from the individual. It is an inner identity of the person, which of course is something we see 
in transgender thinking today. So what I'm trying to say is that these ideas have changed over time, but you'll notice that we have two waves, the 1950s onwards, the sexual revolution, and then from the 1990s, we have queer theory. But many of the, the, the changes in ideas that gave rise to these changes started earlier with the Enlightenment in the 18th century. I'll come back to explain that later. But where was it? How was it that we came to think of gender as something different from biological sex? Well, if you go back to the 1800s, to uh, a dictionary of English then, you will see that gender was defined as kind or breed or sex. In other words, gender meant the same thing as sex, as a biological sex. It wasn't something different. But if you look at the use of the word gender in publications in English, you'll see that from the 1960s onwards, you have a dramatic increase in the frequency of use of the word. And it started to be used in a different way. So that if you look at the modern English dictionary, you have two definitions. The first one is basically the same as the 1800s, that it means the same thing as sex, biological sex. But the second definition, it says, comes from psychology and sociology originally in the USA, which is about being male or female expressed by social or cultural distinctions and differences, not biological ones. Gender is social, biological sex is something different. And we can look at history and we can see who it was that popularized this idea. It was a man called John Money, an American psychologist. He argued that the basic difference between the biological sexes was that men produce sperm and women produce eggs. But there are other differences that are physical that follow from that, sex adjunctive differences, body hair, the size of breasts and so on. And then there are sex arbitrary differences, which are cultural. But he said it's confusing to say sex adjunctive and sex arbitrary. The cultural things, we'll call those gender. We will separate the meanings of those words. And gender is a personal designation or a social designation or perhaps a legal definition. Now, there are controversies connected with John Money. It's interesting to look at his history. He considered relationships with children as potentially being okay, sexual relationships, if they were consensual. Uh, he was involved in some other controversies. So you can check that out yourself. But what I'm trying to say is that here was an idea which didn't originate with, with Money. It was there in 1945 from Madison Bentley, but Money made it popularized in 1955 in the academy, in academic thinking. And that's just one example. You can see the same thing for each of these words that have now become commonplace. The word homosexual only began in the late 1800s, transsexual in 1949, transgender to replace the word transsexual uh, in 1965 and later used slightly differently. Uh, queer theory, that Q word, well, that's from the 1990s, uh, following uh, ideas from, uh, uh, from philosophy. And intersex, that word is from 1993. Uh, well, actually, it originated in 1917 about moths, but it only came to be used about human beings in 1993. So these words have their origin in the academy as a theory. But of course, the academy is not where most people live. So how do these ideas come into popular opinion? Well, they, how do they move from the margins, we could say, from the edges in the academy where people are thinking about these theories into the mainstream? Well, of course, there are causes, there are minority groups for whom these ideas are very important. And for them, this is about their sense of what matters to them. Groups like that are interesting to people in the academy. Academics like to study interesting things, unusual things, minority things. 
So the existence of those groups gives a drive to the academy. And of course, the academy then, by researching them, gives language, the labels that we saw on the last screen, that these groups then use to label themselves. And it gives a sense of credibility because the academics are interested, then this is credible. But that still stays on the margins, the margins, the academ academia, the academy, and the minority groups. How does it come into popular opinion? That is through stories and through images. And you can see this in history. You see it in popular culture, in television, in novels, and in um, uh, movies. You see stories of people and stories that make us sympathize with the person who is in this minority group, with the romantic love that they have for someone of the same sex or with the, the difficulties they have with a sense of their gender being wrong for their body. These stories are powerful. Of course, they can be true stories that people have really had these experiences, but then they are also told in a way that gains our sympathy. Social media is another large part of this, especially for young people. People tell their own story and they form groups of people who share that story and who think in the same way about their identity. And you can see how the, the marginal groups, the minority groups, the, the people with the cause, the campaigners, can tell those stories in social media. And thirdly, increasingly, they tell these stories in education, in schools, Whenever schools, certainly in the UK, want to educate children about these issues, they bring in the campaign groups. So they bring in the people from those groups to tell about their experience. And the result has been a shift in popular opinion because people start to think, well, this is normal for some people and I don't understand it, but it matters to that person and we should be nice to each other. Popular opinion shifts. And policy tends to follow popular opinion. And you can see this, political parties follow popular opinion. The legal profession, laws follow popular opinion. Medicine follows popular opinion. Don't think that doctors, I was one, don't think that they will hold to what is true whenever popular opinion shifts, they won't. Because there is pressure on policy from the minority groups and when they start to look at it and they say, well, the public think this, they also listen to the academy and the academy gives legitimacy to the change in laws. So we see that laws and medical practice have changed in uh, recent decades. There is no longer a diagnostic criteria for people with sexual orientation. That doesn't exist as a, a, a disease category that that could be something wrong. It used to be seen as a disorder, it is no longer. And if your idea of your gender doesn't match your body, well, now that is only classed as a problem if you are distressed because of it, you have gender dysphoria. It used to be that it was seen as a problem even if you didn't feel distressed, but that's not the case any longer. And of course, doctors will give interventions to affirm somebody's sense of gender to relieve their psychological distress. That didn't used to happen, but now it does. They will give hormones, and surgery. And the law has changed as well. Same-sex marriage in 30 Western countries since 20, uh, 2001, when the Netherlands first introduced it. You can change your legal gender in many countries. In some countries, you have to have a diagnosis of gender dysphoria, like the UK. In Ireland, you don't need that in some other countries. And of course, equality legislation protects somebody's gender reassignment which can create a tension with religious beliefs. What I will say though, is that the law and medicine still tend to follow the idea of male and female. You can change your gender, but only from one to the other. So queer theory is not there in the law yet. LGBT rights, the sexual revolution is there, but not queer theory. That's a big question for the future of Western countries. Will it follow queer theory or not? There is a tension which I will come back to. But what I want to finish this session with is simply this. These ideas that came from the academy 
have come into popular opinion, but the campaign groups, like I said, are now bringing them into education back into the kindergarten from a very young age with images like the ones on the screen, which I will explain in the second talk. And now we're seeing that back in the kindergarten, children are being taught that there is no difference between the sexes and that all of these different ways of thinking of identity are good and right, natural for some people.